Welcome, Dr. Aubrey de Grey. Welcome to the Upgraded Executive Podcast. Thank you for having me on the show. No, it's a pleasure. So, Aubrey, could you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. So, I grew up in London and uh, went to university at Cambridge, and I spent about half my life in Cambridge. I moved to California about 10 years ago. The main activity that I was engaged in until my late 20s was computer science. Specifically, I worked in artificial intelligence research for about seven years after I graduated in 1985. During that time, I met and married a biologist. And through her, I first of all accidentally learned a lot of biology. But secondly, I began to realize slowly but surely that neither she nor any of the other biologists I was meeting had any interest in aging. And this was a massive shock to me because I had totally gone through my life assuming that it was obvious to everybody that aging was the number one most important problem facing humanity, the thing that causes by far the most suffering and that therefore biologists would be working on it. And when I found out that that wasn't true, I decided, well, I had to switch fields, really, mm-hmm. because at the end of the day, the reason I was working in artificial intelligence research was that I felt that the problem of work is also quite a bad problem. You know, the fact mm-hmm. that people have to spend so much of their time doing stuff that they wouldn't do unless they were being paid for it. But it's not nearly so bad a problem as the problem of aging. So uh, and I, and at this point, I had been able to take a gloriously undemanding job at the University of Cambridge, a bioinformatics job, which I had taken in order to be able to fund my artificial intelligence research in my spare time, uh, and in which, which gave me a lot of spare time and, of course, access to the university facilities. So I was in this very nice position where I was able to switch fields just by essentially repurposing my spare time. And I was then able, I was earning enough that I was able to pay my way to conferences, because of course back then nobody knew me, I wasn't being invited anywhere, to start to learn a lot and to get known and to publish uh, well-received stuff. I had this kind of eureka moment in the summer of 2000 that has basically dictated everything since. Uh, The realization that there was a radically different way to go about trying to keep people healthy late in life that was a departure from what people had been looking at. And, of course, that turned me into much more of a troublemaker, so to speak, and so I then (laughs) had to embark on the best part of a decade of um, sometimes quite acrimonious debate with people in my community, in the the gerontology community, uh, while they were uh, progressively trying to understand what the hell I was saying and whether it made any sense. Um, That's very much over now. This decade, things have gone... Uh, rather well. Uh, The concept that I put forward in 2000 has become very mainstream and orthodox, and it's been periodically reinvented by other people as if it were original. Um, And uh, and it's now, you know, very much the dominant school of thought within the field. So my own work these days consists of essentially leveraging that, making sure that the um, community, both within academia and beyond, including, of course, the private sector, is as well equipped as possible to implement all of this and to make the whole thing actually happen. That entails, of course, being the chief scientist of a research charity, a biomedical research charity here in California, Sense Research Foundation. Mm. So I oversee a bunch of the most important cutting-edge research in this area. And it also entails um, you know, using my influence to... Uh, optimize the way that everything else is going to, you know, introduce founders of startup companies to investors and such like. Wonderful. So, Aubrey, why the journey from London to California? It's not just that it has better weather. It's that (laughs) it is the place in the world to do anything really pioneering. It's really, you know, to me, the thing that makes Silicon Valley unique is the attitude to failure. Basically, everywhere else in the world, even other, you know, tech um, centers like, you know, Boston or for that matter, Cambridge, in those places, if you fail, um, most people think that you're probably not very good. Mm. But in Silicon Valley, it's just not like that. What happens is that if you fail, the first thought that people have is that you were brave enough to try something really difficult. Mm. Therefore, they'll give you another chance. This is the largest community in the world of people who want to aim high. 
and who are, and that includes, of course, wealthy people who are interested in funding such work and in perhaps making money out of it. And it also includes youngsters who want to just you know, allocate their time to the most important causes facing humanity. So, Aubrey, how would you personally define aging? Aging is actually very easy to define, but you're quite right to ask the question because. There are so many different definitions of aging out there. Essentially, most people, I think, just try to oversimplify it. Aging is simple, but it's not quite as simple as some people try to say. Aging is the combination of two processes. First of all, there's a process that goes on throughout life, and I mean literally, starting before we're born. And that's a process whereby our metabolism, which is to say the normal operation of the body, the entire network of processes that keeps us alive from one day to the next. That network generates changes to the molecular and cellular structure and the composition of the body over time. And um, these changes are progressive. Now, that's, what, that's the first process. The second process happens late in life. And the reason it happens late in life is because it is driven by the changes that are the consequence of the first process. But it's only driven by those changes once those changes have accumulated beyond a particular threshold amount. Because the body is basically set up to tolerate a certain amount of those changes without any significant impact on function, whether mental or physical. But eventually, when that threshold is exceeded, then things start going wrong. And that's the second process where this, these changes, and of course, that's why I use the word damage to denote these changes, these changes progressively drive and, uh, the, the, the emergence and progression of all of the late-life pathologies that we see that constitute the health problems of, 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 of old age. So um, the, the oversimplification that I was talking about comes down to deciding that aging is only one of those two processes, essentially. Mm -hmm. If you do that, then it makes, makes it much harder to see what to do about aging. So if you think about this, what I've just told you, we've got basically metabolism generating damage and then damage generating pathologies. And we want to separate metabolism from pathologies. We want people to carry on doing metabolism, in other words, being alive, without the emergence of these problems of health. So one can immediately see, just from that very abstract definition of aging, that there are various different ways in which one might do that, to separate metabolism from pathology. You could separate damage from pathology. In other words, you could try to keep people healthy, even though they are accumulating these molecular and cellular changes. And people try to do that. That's basically what geriatric medicine is. And as we can see, it doesn't work. And it's no surprise that it doesn't work because the damage is still accumulating the longer someone lives. And so anything that tries to address the consequences of that damage, in other words, the pathologies, anything like that is bound to become progressively less effective as time goes on. So then the other alternative is to think of aging as only the first process, the, um, the, the accumulation of damage, and that what happens later is kind of the consequences of aging. If you do that, then you've got a, a reciprocal issue. And so people will think, well, if aging is this, thing, is this lifelong process, then maybe we can just make metabolism run more cleanly, slow down the rate at which metabolism generates damage. But no, that's, that, that doesn't work either basically because metabolism is just so insanely complicated. And, of course, we understand it very, very poorly. I mean, really very poorly. So it's just not going to happen. And, of course, again, nobody has succeeded in um, you know, substantially postponing the health problems of late life by doing this. So what we do is we are interested in repairing damage, in actually turning back the clock, so letting damage happen, but then repairing it so that it never reaches this level of abundance that kicks off the second process, the late life process. And that's something that people have completely overlooked until I came along 20 years ago. And I believe that a huge part of why they'd overlooked it is because of this oversimplification of the definition of aging. Orby, I've seen your TED Talk, which I thought was fascinating, and I recommend the, the audience check that out. I see you quite often refer to aging as a disease that can be cured. Can you just expand on that for the audience? Okay, so first of all, you must not have been listening very well. Because I go out of my way as often as I possibly can to emphasize that it is completely wrong to call aging a disease. However, it's also wrong to declaim that aging is not a disease. In fact, come the revolution when I rule the world, it will become illegal to use <laughs> the word aging and the word disease in the same sentence because basically any attempt to state something that relates the two always distorts reality. 
Mm-hmm. Aging is a medical problem, for sure. But calling it a disease has connotations. It implies that it's like infections. It's something that can be somehow eliminated from the body, you know, such that you wouldn't suffer it again unless you were reinfected. Yes, it's a medical problem, but we're never going to cure it. So we have to really think about this in terms of periodic preventative maintenance. When I often speak to people around longevity and expanding the human lifespan, they often say to me, why would I want to live forever? You know, I'll get bored. What about overpopulation? What are the most common things you hear from people as things that they see as negatives around living forever oh, or a long time? Yeah, all of those things and lots more. And of course, you have to ask, you know, what's wrong with these people? Why are they fixating on these problems? Because let's face it, if you ask them whether they want to get sick when they get old, they're not going to tell you yes. Yeah, they'll say no, yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, they're not even going to say yes if you ask them whether you want anybody else to get sick when they get old, except mm. possibly their mother-in-law, right? So, um, <laughs> you know, it just it's just breathtaking that so many people are so eager to just completely forget all that and instead think and talk about longevity, you know, about the side effects, because it is transparently illogical to want one thing and not to want the consequences of the thing. In this case, to want to stay healthy as long as you live, but not to want to live longer as a result. It just doesn't compute. And it so obviously doesn't compute that a five-year-old would understand it. So one has to ask, why are people willing to, well, with a straight face, to say things like this? Mm-hmm. It just makes no sense. So, of course, it does make, there is an explanation, but the explanation is psychological. The explanation is fundamentally that everybody does actually know in their heart of hearts that aging is utterly ghastly, it is the worst thing that there is, and that we can't fix it yet. And furthermore, that for the, you know, since the history of civilization, we have been trying to fix it, and people have been periodically coming along saying they know how to fix it, and they've been wrong. Therefore, you know, there's a certain amount of justification for maintaining a degree of skepticism until, you know, until it's really proven that we do have a handle on it now, which, of course, we don't yet. But then, of course, uh, the question then is, you know, what's going to happen if you maintain a, a level of, um, you know, cautious optimism? The answer is you're going to get emotionally involved. You're going to get your hopes up, and people are terrified of getting their hopes up. Mm. So people, the only way that people succeed in... No, putting it out of their minds and getting on with their miserably short lives and making the best of it, you know, rather than being preoccupied by this terrible thing that's going to happen, is by cr- constructing these completely ridiculous, you know, laughable arguments. I mean, people will actually say things like, doesn't death give meaning to life? You know, academics will say this and actually get it published. I mean, <laughs> Jesus wept. And the idea of, you know, oh dear, you know, well, we put all the people. I mean, the answers to these questions are so completely obvious, you know, that we're already fixing the overpopulation problem we have today by limiting the um, use of fossil fuels and moving to meat and so on. And all these technologies are going to be routine way before there are any demographic consequences of defeating aging. So that, you know, it makes no sense whatsoever to be thinking that way. And of course, the same applies to all the other things that one hears, like, you know, when dictators live forever. I mean, for crying out loud. You know, last I read, dictator is fairly high on the league table of risky jobs. It winds me up, obviously, because I've been spending the past 15 years on stage and on camera every other day trying patiently to explain how completely idiotic these concerns actually are. And I still have to do it. Because people just don't want to hear the answers. They want to carry on maintaining this kind of emotional distance from the question. I agree with you, Aubrey, that you know, a lot of it is sort of mindset and psychological. There's a guy called Dan Sullivan that runs Strategic Coach, and Dan's view is he wants to live to 156, so he, he wants to be able to see three centuries. And his mindset is, I always want my future to be bigger than my past. And I love that saying, because if you have that mindset, why would you ever want to die? Why would you ever even want to retire? Right. 
I mean, even if you don't think bigger than your past, even if you think, I don't want to get sick any time in the next 20 years, you know, mm. but that 20 years is a rolling 20 years. It, it mm. doesn't get shorter as time goes by. You know, I don't really think about what I'm going to be doing when I'm 500 years old. I, I just think about, you know, how, like, how good life is right now. One of the things I've heard people like Dave ask me talk about is that if you can live for the next 40 years, you've got a great chance of living, living for the next 100. Would you say that's a fair comment? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I would be happy with slightly smaller numbers than that. I would say if you live for the next 30 years, then uh, you've got a great chance of living for the next 100. And indeed, if you make it to the next 100, then you are virtually you know, home and dry. How long might we live for? Okay, yes. So, perfectly good question. But the answer is, there is no way to put a number on it. The way I can explain that is that once we develop these rejuvenation therapies that are currently under development, and of course some of them even as far as clinical trials, um, once we get them working and working in combination, which is something that I think we have at least a 50-50 chance of achieving within about 17 years from now, Mm -hmm. those therapies will give us perhaps an additional 30 years of life. But because they are rejuvenation therapies, they will give those 30 years not to people who were born then or who were kids then, but to people who are already in middle age then or older, mm. let's say 60 years old for the sake of argument. So what I mean by that is that if we give a 60-year-old these therapies at that time, then they won't be biologically 60 until they are chronologically 90. That's 30 years. So we've bought these people 30 years of time. But we've also bought the scientists 30 years of time Mm. in which to improve the therapies. Now, we will need to improve the therapies because when these people come back and they're biologically 60 again, the damage, what I mean by that is that the amount of damage they have in their bodies will be the same as it was before they got the therapies, right, Mm. when they were 60. But the composition of that damage will not be the same. So we'll be applying these therapies as often as we like, which means that the easy damage will essentially not exist. It will be negligible in abundance. But, and, and the reason these people are biologically 60 for the second time is because the difficult damage on its own has um, risen to the level of abundance that uh, was equivalent to 60-year-old. Right. So we will need better therapies. If we just carry on giving the same therapies, then nothing's going to happen. And the um, person is going to carry on getting more and more damage and getting sick and dying. But of course, this 30 years that the scientists will have had to improve the therapies, that's a hell of a long time in technology, any technology. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're talking here about refining something which is already working at level, you know, at version 1.0. If we look at other technologies in in history, we see that subsequent to the initial fundamental breakthrough, the refinements that improve the quality and the performance of the technology are always really rather steady and rather rapid. So it is absolute racing certainty that by the time these people are 90, we will be able to give them substantially better therapies that will repair not only the easy damage, but also a good chunk of the difficult damage. So we will be able to re-rejuvenate the same people. And that means that they won't be biologically 60 for the third time until they're, let's say, 150. And so on. You know, basically the job is here is just to keep staying one step ahead of the problem. And as you can see, actually it becomes progressively easier to stay one step ahead of the problem because the residual damage that's so difficult that we can't fix it yet becomes more and more residual. Right? It takes longer and longer to reach the pathogenic level. So this is what I've called longevity escape velocity, the minimum rate at which we need to improve the comprehensiveness of these therapies in order to actually do this, stay one step ahead of the problem. And it's certain that we will achieve that subsequent to getting that first 30 years of life extension that I believe we will achieve with this first generation panel of therapies. So what this adds up to in terms of your original question, Ben, is that people will just never get sick from having been born a long time ago. They will always remain young adults, biologically. And therefore, the risk of death will be the same as the risk of death of young adults. So we can ask that question now. We can say, well, okay, if you reach the age of, let's say, 26 in the Western world today, what is your chance of not reaching the age of 27? And of course, it's really small. It's like less than one in a thousand that you will die at age exactly 26, right? 
So the, 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 the scenario is that that proportion, that, that probability per year stays the same in contrast to today's situation where it goes up by about 10% actually with each calendar year of one's life, of one's age. So, yeah, I mean, it's just like radioactive decay then. The, if you like, the half-life of such people is going to be in four digits. It's going to be over a 1,000. Aubrey, you were saying 17 years. Where does that number come from? Because it sounds quite specific. So, yes, of course, it's very subjective. You know, I, it's a kind of an aggregate of a large number of data points that are, that are individually subjective too and that arise from my knowledge of what science needs to be developed, where we already are, how rapidly it's going, mm. what kind of obstacles are likely or unlikely to come along. Essentially, it breaks down into, first of all, the preclinical stage, in other words, getting research from where it is now through to the point where we can begin clinical trials. And that, we're already in clinical trials for a few of the components of what needs to be done. A lot of the others will be in clinical trials in the next one or two years. And I think there will be very few exceptions within five years. I think we'll basically be, everything will be through, phase, through that phase. Then there's actually conducting the clinical trials. Of course, clinical trials take time and some of them don't succeed anyway and you have to start again. So I'm um, adding, you know, at least another five or seven years there to actually conduct these clinical trials and then those clinical trials will be done on each therapy in isolation typically with a patient population that has for whatever reason maybe genetic reason an accelerated accumulation of a particular type of damage so that one can see the results you know um obscured by other stuff and so then comes phase three, which is sticking them all together, combining the same therapies, lots of the same therapies, in the same people at the same time. And, you know, that is not the way that medicine normally proceeds. Medics like to try to keep things simple. So that's going to be a challenge again. So that's why I throw in another, let's say, seven or maybe even as much as 10 years on that part, because we just don't know what kind of obstacles we're going to encounter. So, yes, that's what gets me to this number. Uh, How do lifestyle factors play into anti-aging and longevity? Of course, people ask this all the time because they really want to know, what can I do today? And um, I have to give a somewhat nuanced answer, because the fact is, not a lot. Um, you can't really benefit your life very much um, with lifestyle or diet optimization. At least most people can't. Um, but not nothing either. Every, you know, every day, every month, every year that you can gain by looking after yourself is definitely better than nothing because it improves your probability of making the cut. Mm -hmm. In other words, being around to benefit from the things that don't yet exist that we're working on, even if it only improves that probability by a small amount. Plus, also, I have to emphasize what I mean when I say you can't do it very much. I have to say what the baseline is. Because, of course, there is a big difference between the longevity that you would expect if you have a really bad lifestyle versus a really good lifestyle. So what I always say is that the right way to judge it is to start as baseline being living the way your mother told you to. You know, basically not smoking, not getting seriously overweight, having a reasonably balanced, varied diet. But over and above that, you know, basically not paying much attention. And certainly if you do smoke or you get seriously overweight and so on, then you, your life expectancy will be substantially shorter than the baseline. Mm. But what I'm saying is that whatever optimizations you do, and in the worst of it, different people would have different optimal optimizations, um, whatever you do, you'll only gain a very, very small amount relative to baseline. Is the message really there to look at lifestyle factors to ensure you live for at least the next 17 years so that you make the cut and therefore you can then start to benefit from the therapies? Kind of. I mean, first of all, let us remember that my 17-year estimate is a 50-50 probability. Yeah. I'm always at great pains to point out that any prediction of time frames for any pioneering technology is extremely speculative, and there's at least a 10% chance that we won't get to longevity escape velocity for 100 years. Now, that doesn't bother me in the slightest. It doesn't change my priorities in terms of what research to do and so on. But a 50% chance is quite enough to be worth fighting for. But yes, you will improve your probabilities if you live well. Ultimately, though, the only real way to improve your probabilities, the way that you can improve it a fair bit more than you could by lifestyle changes, is by writing me a large check so that I can get this work done. <laughs> now, I know, of course, that um, you know, not everybody's in a position to write me a large check. But I always say that the poorer you are, 
the more people you know who are richer than you. And that <laughs> means that, of course, it emphasizes the importance of advocacy. So you right now are doing a very important thing by putting me on camera and getting the word out, educating people, getting people to dismiss these stupid ideas of not wanting to live a long time and so on, um, getting them to think rationally like adults about this question. Mm. And the more people do that, the more they will talk about it, the more they will encourage their bosses to do it or other people they know who have more money than them and so on and so forth. At the end of the day, this is going to save a very large number of lives. People often ask me, you know, what, what's my main driver? And they say, you know, do I want to increase my own probability of making the cut? And of course, I would love to make the cut. I do not want to get sick when I get old. But no, that's not what gets me out of bed in the morning. What gets me out of bed in the morning is the fact that for every single day that I bring forward the defeat of aging, I'm saving basically 110,000 lives. That's about 70% of all deaths worldwide. Bobby, could you take the audience through... Uh, the seven categories of aging damage as you define them and some of the things that we could do about each of the categories? Sure. Uh, I'll try and keep it as non-technical as possible. One of the categories is loss of cells. And the fix for this is simply stem cell therapy, putting cells into the body that you have prepared into the right state so that they know what to do to divide and transform themselves into replacements for the cells that the body is not replacing with its own. That restores the number of cells and that is the damage, right? So... We are restoring the structure, in that sense, of the body, of the tissue, to how it was at a younger age. Then there are two categories out of my seven, which look rather similar in the sense that they both constitute having too many cells that you don't want to have at all. But the reason they they are described separately in my classification is because the ways in which we can um, eliminate them are different. So one of those ways is having, having too many cells that are bad because they are dividing when they're not supposed to. And that, of course, is more or less the definition of cancer. And uh, there is, as everybody knows, lots and lots going on trying to deal with cancer. Now, we have made you know, really rather dismally slow progress since Richard Nixon announced the war on cancer in the early 1970s. But that has picked up mostly because of amazing breakthroughs in using the immune system against cancer. That's an idea that people have had for decades, and progress has been more or less nil until a few years ago. But in the past decade, a couple of really important breakthroughs were made that led to major advances, and that's very much still continuing. There are other approaches to cancer, but we have been focused, focused mainly on um, eliminating cancer by controlling the ability of cells to keep the ends of their chromosomes intact, what are called telomeres. Mm-hmm. And there's some very powerful work going on still in that area, which I'm helping with. The other type of having too many cells of a bad kind, the, there are things called senescent cells. These are mm-hmm. cells that are not dividing, but they are also not dying, and they are spewing out toxic stuff. They are somehow able to resist the ability of the body to destroy them. And so what we need to do is destroy them ourselves. Um, The original approach that I advocated nearly 20 years ago was to use what's called suicide gene therapy, which is basically to introduce engineered DNA in cells that makes a protein that kills the cell. And you introduce the DNA indiscriminately, but you arrange that the DNA only actually gets translated into, into this toxic protein um, when the cell becomes senescent. This is an approach that definitely still has legs and people are working on it, including in companies. But it turns out that I was a little over-pessimistic uh, because I expected that it would not be possible, or at least not easy, to identify pharmaceuticals that would selectively kill senescent cells. And it turned out I was wrong. People have succeeded in doing that, and um, some of that work is already in clinical trials and going very, very nicely indeed. All right, that's number three. So the uh, other four categories are not at the level of number of cells. They are at the molecular level. Two of them inside the cell and two of them outside, and the space is between cells. So the first one is mitochondrial mutation. So mitochondria are this very special part of the cell that does the chemistry of breathing. It combines oxygen with nutrients in order to extract energy from those nutrients. And it's got its own DNA. The mitochondria have their own DNA, um, which is the only part of the cell that does. All of the rest of our DNA is in the chromosomes in the nucleus. 
It turns out that the mitochondria is a really bad place for DNA to be because the process of extracting energy from nutrients in the way I just said is very hairy. It, it creates byproducts that are toxic, free radicals. Um, and that means that DNA gets damaged in the mitochondria far, far faster than in the nucleus. So um, we are pursuing and have been pursuing for some time now an approach to addressing this, which was first conceived in the mid-80s, before I was a thing, and um, which involved essentially putting backup copies of the mitochondrial DNA in the nucleus, so that even if the mitochondrial DNA itself is uh, damaged, nevertheless, the proteins that are encoded by it are able to are still in existence. Now, of course, this can only work if we modify the DNA, so that even though it's in the wrong place in the nucleus, mm -hmm. nevertheless, the proteins get you know, re-imported back into the mitochondria. And that might sound terribly science fiction, but it's not, because the thing is, the mitochondria already do this mm -hmm. for the vast majority of their proteins, for more than a thousand proteins. And we've only got 13 proteins with which we need to do this backup copy thing, because those are the ones that are encoded by the mitochondrial DNA. All right, so that's going pretty well. I mean, really quite well now. People have basically mm -hmm. given up. On the um, on the approach by the early nineties, actually, and I came along in the late nineties and decided people have given up a little too easily, and so we started having a go. And um, you know, it is it has turned out to be good, a good deal harder than I was expecting, but a good deal easier than other people were expecting. Uh, so basically, it's very much a thing now. We are recognised as the world leaders in this area, so that's all nice. Um, then the other thing that goes wrong inside cells is a much more simple one to explain. It's just waste products. Byproducts of normal metabolic activity that the cell generates and that for whatever reason it does not destroy or excrete. So when the cell makes a byproduct, um, if it's making it at a respectable rate, then of course what you are going to have is it's going to pile up and pile up and the cell's going to die fairly soon. Which means evolution can't allow that, so evolution develops ways to either destroy or excrete the stuff. Fine. But if there's a particular waste product that, for whatever reason, metabolism only generates at a very, very, very slow rate, then evolution doesn't bother to do that. Because what happens is that the garbage doesn't get to a problematic level until late in life. And evolution doesn't care about old people at all. Evolution only cares about perpetuating genetic information. And of course, old people have already done that by having kids. So yes, so basically that, that's why we need to augment the machinery that cells have, so that so to get rid of the material that accumulates and does cause problems late in life, even though it didn't cause problems until then. There are some major examples of this in, um, in aging. For example, atherosclerosis, the number one killer in the Western world, caused by the slow but steady accumulation of oxidized cholesterol in the artery walls. Then there's macular degeneration. Uh, which is, of course, the number one cause of blindness in the elderly. That's caused by the accumulation, slow and steady, in the back of the eye, the retina, um, of, of a derivative of vitamin A that's created as a side effect of the chemistry of vision. Okay, so what we've done here is we've pursued an idea that I essentially stole from a completely separate area of biology, actually environmental decontamination. In the late 90s, I realized that we might be able to find bacteria that actually can destroy these substances. And this is what environmentalists do to eliminate pollution, like, you know, dioxins or plastics or, you know, explosives from, from the environment. Now, of course, the idea here would not be to inject bacteria into the body. That would have problems. That would have side effects. Um, but what one can do is identify the genes, the genetic basis for how they can destroy this stuff, and then one might be able to put the, those individual genes into our own DNA and achieve the same effect. So that's what we tried to do. And in the case of macular degeneration, it went really well. Uh, we got most of the way there. We actually, one of our first spin-outs took our technology from there, uh, the, a spin-out led by one of our ex-employees. And they finished the last step. They've been able to get very good funding, and they're going to be in clinical trials next year. Wonderful. Uh, on atherosclerosis, we are nearly as far along. All right, so that's five I've done so far. The other two, as I mentioned, are outside the cell. So first of all, there is, again, waste products. These accumulate outside the cell as well. And there, things have been going very nicely. The best known such waste product is uh, senile plaques in Alzheimer's disease, which are made of this stuff called amyloid beta. People realized in the late 90s that you could just vaccinate against this stuff. If you just got the body to... Rec recognize that the senile plaque material was actually foreign, even though well, it's not actually foreign, it's generated by the body, then the immune system of the brain would engulf it and try to destroy it inside the cell. 
And the immune, that, that basically means cells called microglia. And it works. You can vaccinate against this stuff. Microglia will, chop, will, will gobble it up. And because the machinery for destroying stuff inside the cell, even though it's not perfect or else I wouldn't have needed the previous category, right? Um, it's a lot stronger. It's a lot more versatile and powerful than what exists outside the cell. So once the amyloid is inside the cell, it's toast. And this works. You know, <clears throat> it now works in humans. People have actually developed, I think it's now up to four or five immunotherapies, vaccines basically, that cause this stuff to go away in Alzheimer's right. patients. It doesn't have significant cognitive benefits, in most cases anyway, but that's no surprise at all because Alzheimer's is a very multifaceted disease. We've got to fix the other stuff as well. But having this in our back pocket is great. And that same concept has now been taken forward elsewhere in the body because there are other types of amyloid that accumulate in other tissues, especially the heart and the pancreas. And so people are using the same concept now. In fact, we funded a lot of the work that's being targeted to the heart. So that's all great. And that's also been spun out into a company, incidentally. So then the final one is um, cross-linking. So um, turns out that uh, tissues, in some cases, rely for their function on being elastic, on, having, on not being too stiff. And that elasticity uh, arises from the way that what's called the extracellular matrix is laid down. That's a no, kind of lattice of proteins, mostly collagen, and sometimes a few other proteins like elastin, that are linked together in a very regular pattern, and that allows them to be elastic. So this is why the skin is elastic, for example, and um, it's also why the um, lens of the eye can be distorted so as you can see things close up and then can return to its normal shape. Uh, but the most life-threatening example is the major arteries because they have to be elastic in order to essentially buffer the heartbeat and uh, protect the more fragile parts of the circulation, the capillaries. And as time goes on, this elasticity diminishes in all of these tissues. So that's why we get wrinkles. It's also why we get presbyopia, the inability to see things close up. And it's also a large contributor to why we get high blood pressure. Because if we don't have this um, elasticity, then the heart has to pump harder and so on. Uh, so, well, what do we do? The answer is, we first of all have to understand the molecular basis for this loss of elasticity. And the answer has actually been known for a long time, um, up to 40 years in many cases. It's simply that there are spontaneous chemical reactions that occur between these proteins, these collagen and elastin molecules, and circulating sugar in the, in the bloodstream. Those chemical reactions have many potential outcomes. It's a very complicated field. But sometimes the outcome is that a new chemical bond is formed between, the, um, between two proteins that are lying next to each other and were previously able to slide beside each other. And that, now they can't slide anymore because they've got this, um, this, this chemical bond. All right, so the goal is to break these unwanted bonds that are accumulating over time. And uh, it turns out that the structure of these bonds is very different from anything that the body lays down on purpose. So it's not an infeasible concept. Um, but it turned out to be much harder than people were hoping. Uh, however, we funded a, uh, for, for a number of years a very important project at Yale University that um, basically made the key breakthroughs that were required to make this actually a feasible option. And that, again, has now been just spun out this past year into a company. And, of course, they're going to be going forward with preclinical and then clinical trials in the coming couple of years. Incredible. It sounds like great progress is being made across all seven areas, mm -hmm. Aubrey. It is, yes. I mean, if you'd asked me five years ago, I would have had to be a little bit more cautious. I would have said that in mm -hmm. five areas that... Um, you know, great progress is being made, but on the mitochondrial mutation side and on the cross-linking side, progress was still kind of a twinkle in my eye. You know, we knew what we were doing, we felt we were pursuing the most promising path, but the actual, you know, solid progress that um, we could claim was pretty minimal. But in those five years, in both cases, we've made really huge advances, huge acceleration in progress. And so now, absolutely, yes, I can, I can absolutely, with my hand on my heart, say that everything is going really well. And we at Sounds Research Foundation have always taken the view that the right things to prioritize are the most difficult areas. First of all, because they've got to catch up, and also because they tend to be the ones that other people are not working on because other people have other constraints on their priorities, like they've got to publish quickly in order to get, be able to graduate or get promoted or whatever. Plus, I mustn't, let, I mustn't stop without mentioning uh, our education work. 
So for the past several years, we have run this internship program that basically takes um, maybe a dozen undergraduates for a couple of months in the summer. And we have a few of them in our own lab and we place other ones in other labs that we work closely with and essentially get them to learn a lot on uh, hands-on work on how to actually do rejuvenation biotechnology. It has become an extraordinarily successful program. It is oversubscribed each year by a factor of 30 or 40. So it's literally harder to get into our program than it is to get into MIT. Um, And, uh, you know, for that reason, obviously, we would love to grow it. I go out all the time saying to people, saying to potential donors, that this is probably the single most underfunded aspect of what we do. We have been able to grow it somewhat over the past couple of years. And one thing in particular that we've done is we've extended it to giving people a whole year in the lab rather than just the summer, a couple of months in the summer. Typically, we'll take people who've just got their undergrad degree. And um, and that's also been working out fantastically. Even though it's, even though it's only its second year of operation, it's already ten times oversubscribed. And again, we get the most stellar people. I mean, amazing people for the undergrad program. You know, it's normal for our interns to actually do enough work in the lab that they're in that they can actually they'll actually be included as co-authors on publications. At the moment, the anti-aging mission to develop comprehensive rejuvenation technologies is being pursued in parallel by the non-profit sector as represented by Sense Research Foundation and by the private sector as represented by an explosively proliferating number of startup companies. And from the point of view of where the money is coming from to make all of this happen, therefore what we have is on the non-profit side, um, the need for donors, and on the for-profit side, the need for investors. Mm-hmm. Now, both individuals and companies can be either of those things. And indeed, there are quite a few people who've come into this field as investors with an investor mindset, but who have also recognized the value of donating to Sense Research Foundation, uh, not least because if you donate even a fairly respectable amount of money, then you have as much of my time as you want, and you can become aware of the information that will let you be the founding investor of our next spin-out. Beyond that, yeah, I mean, absolutely, you know, the Sense Research Foundation is a non-profit, 501c3, as it's called in the US, which means that you can um, donate tax efficiently, you you can get a tax write-off. I should also mention, since, of course, you guys are British, that we have the same thing in the UK. We have a Sense Research Foundation EU, as it's called. It's a British charity. So the UK taxpayers can donate to us in this way. The same applies to people in continental Europe. There is a rather wonderful organization called Transnational Giving Europe, which is essentially a consortium of charities from around the continent that essentially pass money around. Brilliant. Aubrey, when I was doing some research into Sense Foundation and your background, there were some quite high profile named entrepreneurs that were claimed in the article to be supporting the Sense Foundation. Are you able to mention any of those by name or are they like ultra confidential? No, 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 we certainly are. Um, in fact, very few of our donors have chosen to be anonymous, and none of the biggest ones have. So mm-hmm. private place should totally still go to Peter Thiel, who is mm-hmm. uh, co-founder of PayPal, of course, very well-known uh, investor in visionary causes. And he started donating to us at the level of something like a million dollars a year back in 2006. He was there when nobody else was. Mm. Uh, It took years and years for anybody else to come along and do the same thing. My inheritance was the main reason why we were able to survive and grow, because back then uh, we were relying on very little money. If we do it in dollar terms, I donated about $13 million. Mm. Um, uh, What we decided to do was spend it over a period of five years, because we Mm. felt that that was a nice compromise between, on the one hand, getting good work done, but on the other hand, giving time to attract additional high net worth um, donors over and above, obviously, ramping up our grassroots donations. And it worked just. In 2016, when we were, it was the last year when we were about to run out of money, a very successful guy from the web named Michael Grieve, who essentially uh, created some of the most successful early German websites, 
he started donating a million dollars a year to us, as well as investing in some of the companies that were just emerging back then. And the year after that, we had arrival of Jim Mellon, who is a British investor, very well-known guy, who yeah. had an enormous difference to this field, not just from his money, but also because of the enormous amount that he does in advocacy and getting out there on stage and on camera and in books and um, and blogs and so on, educating other investors. And then at the end of 2017, there was a rather good thing, which was the um, crypto spike. As mm-hmm. people will remember, the um, uh, value of cryptocurrencies went up rather a lot back then, not for very long, but while it did, um, we were given a total of something in the region of six and a half million dollars uh, in the form of four separate seven-digit donations, one of, her, one of which came from, the biggest impact came from Vitalik Buterin, the guy who created Ethereum. Mm. He's an enormous fan, and uh, he's continued to give us money. Uh, one final question for you, Aubrey. What are your top three tips for executives to upgrade their own personal and professional performance? I honestly haven't the faintest idea what executives should do. I mean, of course, you know, in a sense I do, because executives are humans, and the same things apply. Don't get stressed. One thing that we can certainly say about stress is that it accelerates aging only if you don't handle it well. So um, people often ask, you say, okay, what do centenarians have in common, right? Because they'd like to know, you know, so that we could try to emulate it. And it turns out, unfortunately, that they have basically nothing in common. But it's not completely true. There's one thing that almost all centenarians do have in common, and that is nothing bothers them. They haven't necessarily had particularly stress-free lives, but when they get into a stressful situation, they know how not to let it mm. get to. Aubrey, that was absolutely incredible. I think from my own personal point of view, I'm 42 years of age now, so I've got my mind on definitely getting to 80 and hopefully by the time I get to 80, you know, a lot of these therapies will be in a place where I can then start to take advantage of them. And then, as you were saying, then, you know, maybe my AD goes back down to 50 and then I've got more time. So it's absolutely fascinating. You've got a pretty good chance. But remember, first of all, that... We don't know the probabilities. You know, the probabilities yes. are very, very speculative. Mm. But secondly, I think really, you know, I advise you to do what I do, which is to not actually try to motivate yourself in this space by thinking about the prospect of your own benefits. Because the fact is, just mathematically, it's much easier to get out of bed for the purpose of saving 100,000 lives a day than it is for, mm. you know, <laughs> so the humanitarian benefit is much, is a much more rational and logical and powerful motivator, I believe. What a fascinating interview that was. I'd like to thank Aubrey for his time and his insights. Remember, if you would like to access our content one week before it's released, please leave your details at www.upgradedexecutive.com forward slash subscribe and we will send you a special link so you can access the videos one week before we officially release them. You can also follow us on all of our social channels at connect with UE.